Greetings, and welcome back to the channel as we continue to explore the history of science fiction cinema. To say the film's release this year were pretty unforgettable is a bit of an understatement, but there were a few pieces of cinema history worth mentioning. Silent film legend Buster Keaton made his only sci-fi film this year, and Universal Pictures released the studio's final slate of serials, as audiences' interest in short weekly adventures began to wane. There was very little spark to this year's films, due to shifting tides of public interest. After the war, audiences were more drawn to real-life drama of post-war recovery and the booming film noir genre, which overshadowed the fantastical escapism that sci-fi offered. Studios continued to film sci-fi in black and white to save on production cost because they knew that these genre films would make very little money at the box office. But before we get started, I wanted to say goodbye to a legend. H.G. Wells passed away on August 13, 1946, at the age of 79. Wells was the visionary behind The War of the Worlds, The Time Machine, and The Invisible Man, leaving an unforgettable mark on both literature and film. His works not only influenced science fiction literature, but also encouraged countless adaptations and reimaginings on film and television. Not satisfied with remaining on the sidelines of the film industry, Wells wrote the screenplay for 1936's Things to Come, an adaptation of his 1933 novel, The Shape of Things to Come. Though a box office disappointment at the time, it is now a celebrated classic of 1930s science fiction cinema. We owe him a debt of gratitude for the worlds he created and the dreams he ignited. Right after the end of the war, the Mexican film Boom to the Moon, or El Moderno Barba Azul, tried to mix the slapstick humor of Buster Keaton with the genre of science fiction. This low-budget feature is now mostly remembered as a misstep in Keaton's career, his last starring role, and his only venture into Mexican cinema. Directed and co-written by Jamie Salvador, a Spanish filmmaker who made a name for himself in Mexican westerns and comedies. Salvador teamed up with the Oscar-nominated writer of The Stranger, Victor Trivas, and they brought in Buster Keaton, the legendary silent film star, known for his classics like The General from 1926. By this time, Keaton's career had hit a rough patch, and he was mostly relegated to supporting roles. Boom to the Moon gave him one last chance as a leading man. Supporting Keaton were Angel Garraza, a Spanish actor who had fled to Mexico during the Spanish Civil War, and Virginia Surratt playing the daughter of a scientist. The film was also one of the early projects of producer Alexander Solkind, who would later go on to produce iconic films like Abel Gantz's Austerlitz, Orson Welles' The Trial, and the blockbuster Superman films starring Christopher Reeve. The story follows Keaton an American sailor stranded at sea near the end of the war. He thinks he's landed in Japan and tries to surrender to the local police, but it's actually Mexico, and the police mistake him for a notorious serial killer named Bluebeard. To get out of his execution, he agrees to pilot an experimental atomic rocket to the moon. When the rocket malfunctions, it lands in a remote part of Mexico, and the characters mistakenly believe they've arrived on the moon leading to a series of comic misunderstandings that's more reminiscent of 1902's A Trip to the Moon than the contemporary science fiction of the time. The film's production faced some hurdles, particularly Keaton's inability to speak Spanish, which limited his dialogue and forced him to rely on his physical comedy skills. Unfortunately, the old physical gags that made him famous in the past felt out of place here. The film didn't make it to the United States until 1983, when a dubbed, shortened version was released on home video. The reception was far from kind. British film historian Kevin Brownlow called it, quote, the worst film ever made. But I think that's a bit harsh. It may not be a good film, but it's far from the worst I've discussed for this series. It's more of a comedic sketch stretched into a feature. 
despite its flaws, Boom to the Moon does touch on science fiction themes like space travel and the idea of aliens, which were still pretty speculative ideas in 1946. However, the film is mostly remembered as a low point in Keaton's career, a stark contrast to his glory days in silent cinema. While it might hold some interest for Keaton fans or those studying Mexican cinema, Boom to the Moon is largely forgotten today. Boom to the Moon is available on DVD, and there are a few clips available on YouTube, which I'll link in the description below. The Flying Serpent is an American film that straddles the line between horror and barely there science fiction. Produced by the low-budget studio Producers Releasing Corporation, known as PRC, it reflects the era's love for mixing fantastical elements with pseudo-scientific ideas. Directed by Sam Newfield, known for churning out low-budget films I've discussed in previous episodes, like The Mad Monster from 1942 and The Monster Maker from 1944. Leading the cast is George Zuko, a British character actor famous for playing villains in many films I've discussed in the past, like The Monster Maker and Dr. Renault's Secret. He's joined by Ralph Lewis as Richard Thorpe and Hope Kramer as Mary Forbes. Eddie Ackoff, known for roles in The Walking Dead from 1936 and The Phantom Creeps from 1939, rounds out the cast as Jerry Jonesy Jones. The screenplay, written by John T. Neville, shares a similar plot with Bella Lugosi's 1940 film The Devil Bat, which PRC produced and Neville also wrote. So many think it's an unofficial remake because of the similar concepts and plot points. The story follows Dr. Andrew Forbes, a deranged archaeologist who discovers the ancient Aztec god Quetzalcoatl in a remote cave in New Mexico. Realizing the creature's lethal potential, Forbes uses it to eliminate his enemies, like Bella Lugosi used bats in The Devil Bat, with the creature killing anyone possessing one of his feathers. As the mysterious deaths pile up, radio announcer Richard Thorpe and sidekick Jerry Jones start investigating. Produced on a shoestring budget by Poverty Row Studio, PRC, The Flying Serpent was typical of the studio's output in the 1940s, which is evident in the special effects, especially the creature design, which critics often compared to a, quote, stuffed puppet. The film was later re-edited and re-released under the title Killer with Wings. And it even inspired a loose remake in 1982 titled Q, directed by Larry Cohen. While The Flying Serpent includes some elements that could be considered science fiction, like mad scientists controlling a prehistoric creature, it's generally regarded as a horror film, but I wanted to touch on it in this episode, especially with its connections to the devil bat, about a mad scientist, or in this case, a mad archaeologist, using creatures to do his evil bidding. It's pretty cheesy, and even though Zuko carries the film, he can't compare to the Gosi. It is very dialogue-heavy, and I wish they showed Thorpe using scientific means to manipulate the creature. The Flying Serpent is available on DVD and streaming on Tubi TV, YouTube, and the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Before we dive into the rest of the films of 1946, if you're enjoying the content, please hit like and subscribe for more episodes on the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means a lot, and I appreciate everyone stopping by to share their love for this amazing genre. Produced by Republic Pictures, The Crimson Ghost is a 12-chapter serial that blended crime, science fiction, and action, and was co-directed by Fred C. Brannon and William Whitney two of Republic's most seasoned filmmakers. Brannon had already made a name for himself with serials like The Purple Monster Strikes from 1945 and would go on to direct its sequel, Flying Disc Man from Mars, in 1950. Whitney was a World War II veteran known for his work on popular serials like Dick Tracy and The Lone Ranger, and The Crimson Ghost was the last serial he directed. 
Charles Quigley, known for his roles in B-films and serials, would later appear in the 1948 Superman serial, and he stars as Professor Duncan Richards, a criminologist and physicist determined to stop the Crimson Ghost. Linda Sterling, who plays Richards' secretary, Diana Farnsworth, was a familiar face in serials, having starred in Manhunt of Mystery Island and The Purple Monster Strikes. And Kenny Duncan as Dr. Chambers, a prolific B-movie actor known mostly for westerns and making five films with director Ed Wood. The story revolves around the Crimson Ghost attempt to steal the Cyclotrode X, a powerful device invented by Professor Chambers that can disable electrical systems and potentially repel atomic bomb attacks. When Chambers destroys the original device to prevent its theft, the Crimson Ghost forces him to wear a mind control collar and build a larger, more powerful version of the machine. Professor Duncan Richards, with the help of Diana Farnsworth, engages in a series of confrontations with the Crimson Ghost and his henchmen, trying to protect the cyclotrode and uncover the identity of their adversary. The serial was shot in 30 days under the working title The Scarlet Shadow. With a budget of around $162,000, it was Republic's most expensive serial of the year, but it did go over budget due to elaborate action sequences and special effects. Republic Pictures did try its best to keep the identity of the villain a secret, but audiences quickly figured it out because the studio marketed a certain actor's name on the promotional materials. The serial is rooted in science fiction with futuristic technology like the Cyclotrode X and Mind Control Collars central to the narrative. The atomic themes echoed the anxieties of the post-World War II era, and the Crimson Ghost influence has extended far beyond the cinema. The villain's skull mask design was adopted by the punk rock band The Misfits as their logo, and even appeared in Iron Maiden's music video for The Number of the Beast. This serial was one of only two made by Republic ever to be officially colorized, and was also re-edited into various formats, like so many serials of the 30s and 40s. In the 1950s, it was condensed into six episodes for television, and in 1966, it was edited down into 100 minutes and re-released as the TV film titled Cyclotrode X. It is action-packed with plenty of fistfights that were typical for the time, but the story does get old quickly. The use of television for surveillance and collars for controlling people plug into societal fears about population control. My biggest issue is the abrupt ending and no real showdown between the hero and the villain. The Crimson Ghost is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. Lost City of the Jungle was Universal's second-to-last serial to be released. It is an artifact from the waning days of the movie serial era. Set in a fictional Himalayan nation, it blends science fiction, adventure, and post-World War II anxieties. Directed by Louis D. Collins and Ray Taylor, two veterans of the genre, it captures the adventurous spirit of the time. Collins, with a background in silent films, also co-directed The Mysterious Mr. M, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. Taylor was a prolific director with over 150 film credits, including work on 1936's Flash Gordon and Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe. The cast was a mix of familiar faces from serials and B-movies. Russell Hayden played Rod Stanton, an operative of the United Peace Foundation. He's known for the role as Lucky in the Hopalong Cassidy series. Jane Addams, who stars as Marjorie Elmore, recently appeared as Nina in House of Dracula and would go on to play Vicki Vale in the 1949 Batman and Robin serial. Lionel Atwill, a veteran of many universal horror films like Son of Frankenstein, plays Sir Eric Hazarius. Kai Luke plays Tal Shan. He's famous for his roles in the Charlie Chan series and 1984's Gremlins. Set in the aftermath of World War II, 
Lost City of the Jungle, follows an agent of the United Peace Foundation. As he tries to stop, Sir Eric Azarius, a warmonger who fakes his death and assumes the identity of Geoffrey London. Azarius is searching for Meteorum 245, a rare element believed to defend against atomic bombs. Azarius manipulates the local powers of the fictional nation of Pendrang, and Stanton must navigate this dangerous landscape, uncover Azarius' identity, and prevent another global conflict. The production faced significant challenges, particularly due to the illness and then death of Lionel Atwill during production. Universal Pictures was forced to decide between scrapping his footage that he already filmed or creatively adjusting the story. They chose the latter, leading to major rewrites and reshoots. Atwill's character, originally the main villain, was demoted in favor of another actor who would take on a larger role after rewrites and a double often shown in disguise or from a distance was used to complete Atwill scenes. Universal also reused footage from earlier films, a common cost-cutting practice at the time, like plane scenes from Lost Horizon from 1937 and the sulfur pit scenes from Son of Frankenstein in 1939. Lost City of the Jungle centers on Meteorum 245, a fictional element that could defend against atomic bombs. The post-war setting focused on preventing future conflicts through advanced technology and peaceful mediation. Today, Lost City of the Jungle is remembered more for its production struggles than its cinematic achievements. This is another serial with lots of talking, but it was nice to see prominent roles for Asian actors instead of just playing stereotypical characters. The production design is much better and more expensive looking than most serials that tended to look cheap. Lost City of the Jungle is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. The Mysterious Mr. M is a 13-chapter sci-fi thriller blending crime, mystery, and futuristic tech and mark the end of an era as Universal Pictures' 137th and final movie serial. Co-directed by Louis D. Collins and Vernon Keyes. Collins co-directed Lost City of the Jungle earlier this year, and Keyes was an American director and producer known for working in Westerns. Universal brought in two veteran writers, Joseph F. Polin and Paul Houston. Polin was a co-writer on Captain America from 1944, and Adventures of Captain Marvel from 1941. And both men also wrote Lost City of the Jungle this year. The cast was a familiar mix of serial regulars and character actors. Richard Martin, known for his reoccurring role as Cheetah Rafferty in almost 30 films, played Detective Kirby Walsh. Pamela Blake plays insurance investigator Shirley Clinton, and Dennis Moore as Agent Grant Farrell. Our villain, Anthony Waldron, was played by Edwin McDonald and appeared in films like Black Friday. The plot centers on Anthony Waldron, a criminal mastermind everyone believes to be dead, but he's secretly operating from a lab hidden beneath his grandmother's mansion. Waldron uses a mind control drug to manipulate people, aiming to steal plans for a revolutionary giant submarine. However, Waldron's ambitions lead to unexpected consequences, as they usually do in these serials. Our federal agent, our detective, and our insurance investigator team up to unravel the mystery of the shadowy figure known only as the mysterious Mr. M. Though it was Universal's final serial, the mysterious Mr. M still had to use some creative cost-cutting. The production made use of stock footage from earlier serials like The Phantom Creeps, King of the Texas Rangers, and G-Men vs. the Black Dragon. The serial's opening credits even featured shadowy silhouettes of Rondo Hatton, Basil Rathbone, and Nigel Bruce, taken from The Brute Men from 1946 and The Pearl of Death from 1944. Its focus on futuristic technology and speculative themes should have made it an intriguing story, but the filmmakers never take full advantage of the revolutionary submarine engine at the heart of the plot. 
There's more talk than science fiction, though the mind control drug that taps into the fears of manipulation and loss of free will were themes that were particularly resonant in the post-war era. Today, the mysterious Mr. M is remembered more as a footnote in the history of serials. Its abrupt ending really downgrades the serial for me, but the action is good when it does occur. The inventive cliffhangers help the slow and wandering plot. The Mysterious Mr. M is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. I've linked all the films discussed today in the description below if you would like to check them out. So this was a pivotal era for science fiction literature, shaped by the anxieties and technological leaps of the post-war era. The atomic bomb cast a long shadow over the genre. Pat Frank's dark comedy, Mr. Adam, imagined a world where all men, except one, are left sterile after a nuclear disaster. And in Murder of the USA by Will Jenkins, published in Argosy Magazine under the original title, Adams Over America, painted a chilling picture of atomic destruction and the aftermath of American retaliation. Stories about first contact with aliens were also on the rise. Stanislaw Lem's debut sci-fi novel, The Man from Mars, delved into the challenges of communicating with Martian intelligence. Meanwhile, Arthur C. Clarke made his professional writing debut this year in astounding science fiction with two stories, Loophole and Rescue Party, both exploring the impact of humanity's rapid technological progress on alien civilizations. C.L. Moore and Henry Kuttner, publishing under the pseudonym Lawrence O'Donnell, wrote Vintage Season, a time travel tourism story that questions the ethics of observing historical disasters. The anthology Adventures in Time and Space, released by Random House, was a major milestone, bringing together stories from both established and up-and-coming authors like Robert A. Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, A.E. Van Vogt, and Henry Kuttner. And Chan Davis's The Nightmare broke new ground by tackling the theme of nuclear terrorism, showing how science fiction could address the fears and potential threats of its time. The world was starting to pick up the pieces after the devastation of the war. Governments, especially in Europe, were facing the enormous task of rebuilding not just cities, but their economies and societies that had been deeply scarred by the conflict. To truly understand the rise of science fiction films in the late 1940s and 1950s, it helps to look at what was happening in the world during this time. So let's take a quick look at some key historical, cultural, and cinematic moments from 1946. The United Nations, created to keep peace and security around the world, held its inaugural session of its Security Council on January 17th. But even as the world hoped for peace, tensions were rising, setting the stage for what would become the Cold War. Winston Churchill highlighted this shift with his famous Iron Curtain speech on March 5th in Fulton, Missouri. Meanwhile, many were pushing for independence. Syria broke free from France on April 17th, Transjordan, which would later become Jordan, gained independence from Britain on May 25th, and the Philippines celebrated independence from the United States on July 4th. In Asia, there were massive political changes. India saw the formation of an interim government led by Jawaharlal Nehru on September 2nd, but the region wasn't free from conflict. The First Indochina War began on December 19th, when the Viet Minh attacked French forces in Hanoi. War crimes trials began in Japan on April 29th, and the Nuremberg trials in Europe were concluded on October 1st, with the sentencing of Nazi war criminals. Hermann Göring did not wait for his execution and committed suicide on October 15th. 1946 was also a year of social and scientific milestones. Women in Japan voted for the first time in a national election on April 10th. The nuclear age began on July 1st with Operation Crossroads, marking the first nuclear test at Bikini Atoll. 
This test would later inspire the creation of Godzilla in films during the 1950s. In 1946, the cultural scene was booming in art, music, and television. Abstract Expressionism was gaining momentum in the art world. Jackson Pollock's third solo exhibition at Peggy Guggenheim's Art of This Century Gallery showcased 11 oil paintings. This marked an important transition in his artistic development as he moved towards his signature abstract style. While M.C. Escher's intricate lithograph, Three Spheres Two, showcased his signature play with perspective. Music lovers saw the emergence of future legends and the collaboration of iconic artists. Eddie Howard and his orchestra topped the U.S. charts this year with To Each His Own. To each his own, to each. While Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong recorded their first duets. Oh, you won't be satisfied until you break my heart. On Broadway, Annie Get Your Gun premiered on May 16th, starring Ethel Merman as Annie Oakley with songs by Irving Berlin. In literature, George Orwell began writing his dystopian masterpiece, 1984 on the remote Scottish island of Jura. Television technology took a leap forward. RCA's 630TS introduced this year was the first mass-produced television set that helped establish RCA as a leader in the post-war television market. Beyond the Arts 1946 saw the introduction of a daring two-piece swimsuit called the Bikini in Paris on July 5th and marked a significant shift in swimwear fashion and reflected the liberated spirit of post-war Europe. Science took major strides forward that would shape the future in remarkable ways from astronomy and geology to computer science. On January 10th, the U.S. Army Signal Corps, Project Diana, made history by bouncing radar waves off the moon officially kicking off the space age. This achievement not only opened the door for space exploration, but also proved that radio signals could travel beyond Earth's ionosphere. Meanwhile, at Harvard, Reginald Aldworth Daly proposed the giant impact hypothesis, suggesting that a massive collision might have led to the formation of the moon. On February 14th and 15th, the ENIAC The first electronic general-purpose computer was unveiled at the University of Pennsylvania. Later this year, on December 11th, Frederick Collin Williams patented a random access memory device, pushing computer technology even further. In geology, Arthur Holmes made headlines by estimating Earth's age using uranium-lead dating. On June 14th, the world mourned the death of John Logie Baird, the inventor of the first working television system. He revolutionized how people receive information and entertainment. As the world emerged from the shadows of World War II, the film industry experienced a resurgence of creativity and global recognition. Hollywood wasn't without its controversies, especially with the release of Disney's Song of the South. The film drew criticism for its portrayal of African Americans and post-Civil War plantation life, sparking controversy about race in American society and the film industry. Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life premiered, starring James Stewart as George Bailey, a man contemplating suicide on Christmas Eve until his guardian angel intervenes. Though it's now a holiday classic, the film initially struggled at the box office and didn't connect with audiences at the time. In the United States, the year's biggest films were The Best Years of Our Lives, Duel in the Sun, and The Jolson Story. The 19th Academy Awards were held on March 13, 1947. It reflected the post-war themes that dominated cinema at the time. The Best Years of Our Lives was the big winner, winning seven awards, on its eight nominations, including Best Picture. The film follows three World War II veterans struggling to adjust to civilian life. 
William Wyler won Best Director for the Best Years of Our Lives. Frederick March took home Best Actor for his role in the same film, and Olivia de Havilland earned Best Actress for her performance in To Each His Own. While the popularity of film serials was starting to fade, 1946 still saw well-liked releases like The Scarlet Horseman, The Phantom Rider, and King of the Forest Rangers. Cinema beyond Hollywood experienced a major resurgence as countries emerged from the war. Jean Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast offered a magical French retelling of the classic fairy tale. Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger's A Matter of Life and Death was a romantic fantasy about a British airman who cheats death and must argue for his life before a celestial court. Italian neorealism continued to gain influence with Roberto Rossellini's Paisan, a war drama depicting the Allied liberation of Italy, while the British-Australian western The Overlanders was about cattle drivers in northern Australia during the war. Hollywood delivered some unforgettable films that have since become classics. Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious brought together Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman in a gripping romantic thriller about a woman tasked with spying on Nazis in post-war Brazil. The Big Sleep, a film noir directed by Howard Hawks, featured Humphrey Bogart as the sharp-witted private detective Philip Marlowe, with Lauren Bacall as his mysterious client. Rita Hayworth dazzled in Gilda, playing the ultimate femme fatale opposite Glenn Ford in a tense love triangle featuring the most famous hair flip in Hollywood history. Finally, The Postman Always Rings Twice turned up the heat with Lana Turner and John Garfield in a steamy film noir where a drifter falls for a married woman, and together they hatch a deadly plan. This was once again a year of science fiction literature outshining cinema, but the motion picture's golden age is fast approaching. Even as sci-fi struggled to find its footing in a post-war world dominated by more immediate concerns of rebuilding a society torn apart, there were still signs of hope. The continued use of black and white film reflected the genre's budget constraints at the time, but that didn't stop these movies from delivering some intrigue and adventure that sci-fi fans craved. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content. And I will see all of you in 1947.